Okay, can everybody hear me? Here we up. Nice. I don't know what this thing is. If I go back to full screen, I think maybe it doesn't show my screen anymore. <laughs> okay, well, that's not super important. I'm not sure what that thing is. This is my work laptop, so it could be anything. <laughs> you guys super hyped about uh, GraphQL? Yeah. Ooh. Okay. Oh. Nice. Cool. Uh, I'm Candy. Thanks for coming out. Um, I work here at Cabbage, and today we're going to talk about <laughs> using GraphQL, uh, in particular, GraphQL in net where the, um, hang on. <laughs> so I'm Candace, and I'm running this talk tonight. Um, so GraphQL.net, what is it, and how can we keep users from getting uh, to parts of your graph that you didn't want them to get to? What is GraphQL? So this talk is mostly meant for people who are familiar with GraphQL as a concept. Maybe they've never used it before, but they're kind of familiar with it. They've seen it. They say, hey, this is pretty cool. I wonder if we could do this in .NET. This talk is mostly for you. If you're coming into this thing and you've never heard of GraphQL, then strap in, because it's going to be fun, but it's going to be a lot. So GraphQL, uh, at a high level, is a query language for your API. So Normally, when you write an API, you write it as a REST API. You've got multiple endpoints, and each one of these endpoints takes a certain kind of and returns a certain kind of response. With GraphQL, you have one endpoint, and then you can send a, a query that, is, that works kind of how you would expect a SQL select statement to work. You can send that query to this one endpoint, and then that endpoint will resolve it and return it back. So you can ask for all of the resources that you would have to have multiple endpoints for with REST, all in one endpoint. Uh, a great thing about it is it reduces the checks of the front end to your API server, because instead of having to have like get user by ID 1, get user by ID you can instead uh, have them both run at the same time on the same request and come back in the same response. So it reduces chattiness. You can get all of your data all at one time in one call. Uh, and it's client-determined response model, which exactly how a SQL select statement works. If you select you know, this column and this column and this column, that's what comes back and nothing else. It is not SQL, but it just works kind of like you would expect it to. It's language and data store agnostic which means that there are many, many implementations of GraphQL for the server, not just in .NET. And it's more of a spec, not exactly a technology. So if you want to write one in Haskell, go ahead. You can do that. Just follow the spec instructions, and you will have a GraphQL framework. Uh, it's also data store agnostic. It's not, you don't have to have a graph database. Our databases are relational. It works just the same because you set up your schema, in our case, in C Sharp, as POCOs. And then you direct the graph how to get to each POCO from each, each parent POCO. So you've got a parent object and a child object, and you just tell it how you could traverse through the graph through these objects. One thing about it, though, is that it is extremely complex on the server side. Because with the REST API, you know exactly what response you should give for any request, because the requests are always the same. Maybe there's a couple parameters missing, but it's sort of analogous to a stored procedure is to a select statement. One is very dynamic, and one is the same every single time, except maybe some arguments are different. Same thing with a GraphQL API. If you want to have a Hello World GraphQL API that just selects everything and gives it back and lets the framework filter out what you don't want, that's really, really easy. But if you want something that isn't going to knock over your database, it's really, really hard. And that's some of the things that we've been solving here at Cabbage is how to not knock over the database, but still allow flexibility for our front end users. Uh, it's intended to work only with JSON. This is sort of a con and a pro, because if you want to use, for some reason, if you just had to return XML, you couldn't do it with GraphQL. If you want to return protobufs, you can't really do it with GraphQL if you want to stick to the spec. Uh, but JSON is gzip friendly, so that's something. 
I've been kind of excited about this talk, so I've been talking to it, talking about it to a lot of people. And one of the like major misconceptions when I'm telling them I'm, I'm doing a talk about GraphQL is, oh yeah, how does it handle like different kinds of databases? It doesn't care. There is absolutely nothing in the spec about databases or database technology. It's just you set up your schema and then you pass it a function to go get your data. However that function works, it doesn't care. Um, as I said, it's a spec, not really a technology. So if you don't want to use this particular framework that we're going to be talking about, which is GraphQL.net version 2.4, um, then you don't have to. You can write your own. And this talk also is not about GraphQL being the authority on what your user should see, but rather how to tell this particular framework how to respect authorities that you've already set for your user. Uh, we're um, in our case, it's going to be the claims principle if it's a .NET Web API. Um, so how did we even get into GraphQL? We have so my team works on a we the third-party data and we store it in this big database and then other teams use this third-party data for things like deciding how much uh, how much someone is credit worthy and for how much money that we can loan them and then the front-end teams use it to display things like metrics on, on their their revenue and things and right now all of these teams kind of just go to the same monolithic DB and they get what they want and then they do stuff with it. But what we want to move to is a more microservice architecture. And to do that, first we have to put an API in front of this database so that we can break it up into a more domain-specific microservices and their own databases. This database has hundreds of tables. That's a lot of REST endpoints, and I don't want to write all of those. So we're using GraphQL instead so that our customers can have the flexibility of a SQL-like syntax, and we don't have to write a million endpoints to serve all of those needs ease of customer operation. So with all that, uh, tonight we're going to be talking about how to set up, first off, the sort of hello, uh, hello world authorization example that this framework gives you out of the box. It's really simple, and you can follow their documentation and just copy paste it in there, and it just works. It doesn't work exactly like I would want it to, and it also doesn't work how a lot of uh, GraphQL APIs are expected to work. So then we're going to take a closer look at how it works so that we can manipulate it into doing more of what we want to do. And then after that, after we've learned about how different parts of this framework work, we're going to jump into what Cabbage's need was, which is a different kind of access control, which is attribute-based access control. Rather than basing it off of the role on the user on the claims principle, we'll be basing it off of the user ID and saying, all of these rows in this graph, or in this node, the user can see the ones that have the same user ID as them. So I need to explain how the sample project is set up, or else none of the queries are going to make any sense. But uh, so first, some vocabulary. When I say I'm going to say auth a lot, I don't mean authentication. I will always mean authorization uh, in this talk. Uh, role-based and attribute-based access are two different kinds of authorization. One is uh, role-based, which is going to be table-level and column-level access. So the admin user has access to the payments table or has access to the balances field in the tables object. Attribute-based, which is going to be user123 has access to all the rows that have foreign key to user ID123 in them. Uh, for those of you that don't use .NET, um, uh, a claims principle is going to be a built-in .NET class that holds on to your auth information. Uh, it's passed around in requests. It's going to have your session tokens. It's going to have whether or not you're authenticated. And it's going to have any roles that you've set on that user when they logged in. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about different kinds of middleware. Um, middleware is usually just a general term that means code that runs before other code with the same parameters, usually. Um, GraphQL has a couple of different middlewares a field middleware that runs before the resolution of each field, and then also just a regular request middleware that runs at the beginning of the, the query resolution. And then a couple of graph type words. Uh, a node is going to be analogous to an object in C Sharp, and an edge is going to be um, a, when you traverse down to child objects, that's an edge. Now, 
I had to make an entire new schema because I can't show you guys what our actual data schema looks like. But this is a very simple sort of fintech, vague kind of schema. And we've got four tables. Three of them are product tables, so credit lines, loans, and checking accounts. And then we've got a table of cash flows, which are going to be all the transactions in each one of those accounts. So if you have a loan account, you're going to have a child object, an edge, to a list of cash flows. Um, and the top level here is the entry point of our graph. So you can start in checking accounts and then traverse to cash flows and get all of the, the cash flows for a checking account. Cash flows has a foreign key to each one of these product tables to let you know which one belongs to which one. Product tables have a foreign key to a user product ID, which is a mapping between a user and a product. However, and this will be more important later, we don't actually have access to this data directly. This belongs to another API, sort of separations of concerns. And we'll come back to that later, because it's important for the cabbage use case, because we would have done it a little differently if we didn't need to worry about calling another API. So this is what it would look like in our sample project, just a regular GraphQL query without any authorization. So we start out in checking account, and we tell it which one, and then we tell it which, um, which fields that we want to do, and then we say, give me all the cash flows and give me all the amounts and all the transactions for all the, or all the transaction dates for all the cash flows. And this is what you get back. It's exactly what you asked for, which is really, really cool. So if you were to switch the order of these things, so if you put current balance on top of user product ID there, they would be switched in the response. It matches the response to what you asked for, exactly how you would expect SQL to work. Um, it's not SQL, but it's obviously based off of it. Um, also, for the same thing more than once, you can arbitrarily large queries, which is really interesting, but also a little bit tricky for the back end. Um, but if you ask for current balances twice, it would return twice in exactly the same order that you asked them for. So if you had two of them here, they would come back two of them in a row. If you spell it, it doesn't work. Also, it's case sensitive. So now that we know what it's supposed to look like, let's talk about how they implemented a um, role-based authorization in this framework. So. If you go and you read their documentation, they'll just give you a long list of things to copy paste. So we're just going to walk through them so that we have the idea of the sections of the framework that are involved. So first thing you have to do is you have to download their authorization package so you have some of these extra classes. And then in your uh, services collection and your startup, you would then just add this evaluator and this validation rule. And then using the .NET uh, built-in authorization settings, you would say add policy for admin policy and all of my users that have the role of admin belong to this admin policy. And that's all you'd need to do. And then you would go create something called GraphQL user context. So when a request comes in to your GraphQL server, GraphQL uh, will take it, will hijack that request, and replace it with its own request context object that contains additional useful things like the, uh, the graph object itself, the document, the original query, your location in the graph, the field definitions, everything that you would need to resolve this query. Which means you don't have access to the original request object once the query starts to run. So what you can do instead is you can uh, make this user context object, which is poorly named, it ought to be called like developer context because it's something for the developer to have to add extra information to pass around with this GraphQL context because you don't have access to the request anymore. And what I'm doing here is when I build this GraphQL context, I'm just passing the request in and I'm getting the this principle off the request so that I have it for when I go to resolve my query. And then here, this is uh, a controller that's listening on slash GraphQL and the post body is gonna be the request object itself. And then I'm passing this new GraphQL user context, I'm passing it the request here. Normally, you wouldn't use a controller. You would use their magical middleware that they give you, which does the same thing. It's going to um, catch the request. It's going to check the route, and then it's going to resolve the query and return the response. But I think if you're not used to GraphQL, if you're just starting out and you want to use this product to kind of base some ideas off of, I think it's a lot easier to understand what's going on and a lot easier to debug if you just have a controller there doing the same thing. If you want to use subscriptions, which is something we're not going to talk about tonight, but you can later, you definitely need to be aware because this isn't going to work with WebSocket. 
but this is how I'm setting the request object on this, um, on this user context. And then you've all you have to do is go around to all of your schema objects, which is this is one of them. So I've got a checking account, and I'm telling it all the fields on the checking account, and I'm telling it that it's got a list of cash flow types as a field on that checking account, and I'm telling it how to get that out of the my little SQLite database I've got set up. So all you have to do is add dot authorize with on any schema object, either a field or the object itself. And what it'll do is then when you try to access that object through the API, if you don't have that policy, you get rejected. So you can either add it on the top level here with this dot, or you can add it on individual fields. And it will also count for anything underneath what you've set. So if you block the entire object, it's going to block any child object underneath it as well. So it just like cuts off that branch of the tree, basically. Um, and then that's it. That's, their, that's the whole thing. So now, if we run the same query as we had before, minus the cash flows uh, edge, if we run it again, we ask for current balance, which we had dot with authorize on before, you get this nice error message, which is pretty cool. That was easy. You don't have to know how it works. You just plug it in, and then it goes. This is assuming that your user doesn't have the admin policy on it. A really neat about GraphQL is the ability to make arbitrarily large queries. So you can ask for multiple things multiple times. This is equivalent to saying uh, with a REST API, you know, get for user ID one, get for user ID two, you'd have two requests that do that. Maybe they run at the same time, but you'd have two requests. You can do the same thing here in one query, and you can just name them, like this one is a, this one is now named B, and that way they come back as, a, as an object, as a dictionary, and you can um, index key them to find the one that you're looking for. So what do you think happen since we have current balances set as with authorized and my user is not an admin, and we just saw that it killed our query last time, if we're asking for it here, and we're asking for it here, what happens? Well, it rejects your request because you ask for something you don't have access to, which I don't like that, and it doesn't really agree with how you would expect GraphQL to work, because the whole reason for using GraphQL is so that you can make all of your queries all at one time. If you made two REST requests and one of them was unauthorized, would you cancel any open REST requests? No, that's silly. You've got two completely separate queries that ought to be resolved individually. If you fail this one because you don't have access, then set it to tell me that I didn't access it, but resolve all of the data that you can, because if you're using the idea of batching all of your queries into one, you're going to have big sections because one query failed. It doesn't really, it kind of goes against the principle of the thing. So oh, I just talked about this. So now let's look a little deeper into how magical authorization checks were working and then we can change them up a little bit to make it work like it should work. But before we can do that, we have to talk about, well, how it's working. So when a request comes in, the request comes in, it builds that GraphQL context from your request, and it starts to build a document tree from your query. Uh, after it builds that tree, it then walks down the tree. And fun fact, this is actually the first time I've ever seen a real life usage of depth first search that wasn't in like an algorithm test. But it's going to walk down the tree depth first. And um, on each node that it finds, it's going to run all of the validations against that node. These validations are mostly, well, completely used for syntactical correctness. So making sure you included your closing parentheses, or if you had an argument that you said was a string and you passed an int, it's going to fail because that's invalid. It's not, it's not typed. Um, it's not type correct. So it's going to run all of these validations. Recall when we did the Hello World and we set up the services uh, collection additions, one of them was a validation rule. And so what they're doing is there's a validation rule that's checking the field definition for if that with authorize has been set, and then it's checking that user context that you created that you put the claims principle on, and it's saying, one, has this been set to need authorization? And two, is the user that we have a claims principle for, 
Do they have the same authorization as we said that this thing should have? And if it finds one that it hasn't, when it gets to that node, it sets an error. And then when it gets done running through all of the nodes and all the validations, it just stops. So here, if there was an invalid something or other in your validations, it just stops. It doesn't continue to resolve the query. Um, oh, yes. There's a, um, there's a set of lifecycle hooks for the, um, as the query is, as parsed. And one of them, the only one we're really going to be talking about tonight is an after validation hook. So it's going to run all the validations, and then it's going to run after validation, and we're going to use that later on. Um, but just know that's there. But if it does succeed and there are no validation errors, then it starts doing uh, the actual field resolution. And before each field, you can set any number of middleware, which are going to run with the same context as your fields. Um, so you can do some checks there if you need to, which is what we're about to do. And then once all of that is done and all of the fields are resolved, then it returns um, your values or if really the only thing that'll happen there that'll cause errors are things that will cause the entire thing to fail, like uncaught exceptions. So you're probably either good to go or something very, very wrong has happened. So for the hello world, the most important things to know about how that works is just there's a field definition where we tell it that a field needs authorization and for what role to authorize it for. And there's also a validation role that they provide for you that you registered in your services collection um, that defines well, the validation role. But a validation role is just going to be an event handler on node enter when it's walking down that document tree on each node. And there's, you know, there's 25 of them or so that are built in that are just checking for syntactical correctness. And then there's any number that you can add on after that. So the important parts of what we're going to change to make this a little better is, again, the field definition is the same. We're not going to change that, actually. Um, we're going to add a field middleware instead of a uh, validation rule, because the validation rules, if they find an error, they're going to cancel your query no matter what else might have been perfectly fine. But with a field middleware, it's going to try to resolve each field individually. And if one fails, it's going to move on to the next one. Uh, and then our resolve field context, which is going to be um, that execution context that has the GraphQL user context that has our claim on it that's going to get passed through that middleware and then passed on to our field so we can resolve it. So the first thing we need to do is get rid of that validation rule that we registered last time. So just delete that and don't worry about that. Um, everything else is the same here. We've still got the same admin policy, and we're still using their authorization evaluator because it gives us those handy helper methods like authorize with. Now, we're going to author some authorized middleware. And all this is going to do is it's going to run with the same context that a field resolution would run, which is this resolve field context. And on it is going to be the field definition for the current field that we're about to resolve. So you can just say context.field definition requires authorization, which is going to check and see if it has a need for authorization and also if that authorization is valid for your user. And then if they do require authorization, then it's going to cause an error here. And we're going to return this from result of null, which will cause the field to be null when, when we get our, our answer back from the API. And if everything is fine, instead we're just going to do next context, which is going to call either the next middleware in front of this field or the field itself. And then this is another thing that we haven't talked about, but there's also um, execution options where you can tell GraphQL small things like enable metrics and expose exceptions and things. And one of them is where you would register your validation rules and your, um, your custom field middleware. So here, we're just saying, well, we're not adding a rule. We're just saying use the core rules. Um, but we're registering our middleware, so we're just saying use authorized middleware there. So now, if we run the same query as before, before, with the hello world stuff, what it would do is it would just cancel your whole query. It's, oh, you had one thing wrong. We're done. Blank page. Nothing. Now, it's going to tell you that you're not authorized for current balances. It's going to leave current balance blank, and then it's going to resolve everything else that it, that it can, because that's great. And this is um, a pretty common pattern in GraphQL, where you'll get back an error message and also your data, because you're asking for 
what would have been, you know, an enormous amount of calls all at once, some of them are going to fail. Sometimes you're going to have uh, uh, parts of your system that are just down or they're slow or they can't resolve in time. You don't want your whole app to fail because one thing is failing. You want, what is that called? Graceful degra degradation of services. And this is a mechanism to allow that. So now that we know all about how validation rules work and how field works and how the context works, now we can talk about what if you need to do something that isn't built in. All they have built in is role-based access, but Cabbage doesn't use role-based access. We use attribute-based access. We have a user one, two, three, and we have an enormous table with all of the user's data, and we just want access to ones that go with that one user. So we have to use something a little bit different. So the business need, and this is, I'm going to come back to that schema because it's, it's set up in a contrived way to make sense without actually being our real schema. Um, what we want to do is we want to get all of the cash flows for a single user for one or more of that user's product. So recall, the only way to enter this graph was from a product, and then you can get all the cash flows for that one product. But what we want to do is instead go straight to cash flows and get a list of cash flows for multiple products all at once so that they can be ordered um, chronologically. We want to fail requests that ask for product cash flows that don't belong to that user. So you can't just send in a bunch of random IDs and get a bunch of other people's data back. Um, these user IDs are going to be sent as headers on the request. And since we don't own the mapping between a user ID and a product, we just have the user product ID foreign key, we need to ask an external API, hey, are these IDs valid for this user ID? And because this is a very busy API, we want to minimize that overhead of having to call an external API to check for every single request. So what we want to do is we want to do a head call, and we want to make one call. Even though these queries are arbitrarily large, and they can be as nested as you want, and you have no idea what shape they're going to be in before they come in, other than the relationships between the objects. But you don't know how many of them. So recall, so this is how the data actually is, because it's in a SQLite database in the sample project. It's in Postgres in real life. Um, so we've got relational tables, but we're exposing it as a graph. So now we've got another top-level object here, cash flow, which doesn't connect to anything, because it's everything you need all in one. And cash flows have know which product they belong to, but they don't know what user they belong to. So what we want to do is here's what we've been working with before, and here's what we want to be working with now. Uh, so we've got cash flows, and then the product for that cash flow. So we need a few things to get this done. We're going to need to alter our user context, that GraphQL user context. We're going to need to put a property on it to hold all of the product IDs that a user has. So we've got them all in one place. And we're going to need a place, a property on there to hold the user ID as well. Because um, we're not going to have access to the request once this thing starts running. We're going to need to make a validation rule. I mentioned it slightly before, and we'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to the code. But validation is not a very good word for what those are. They're event handlers for node enter. So when it walks down the tree, it the uh, when it enters a node, it triggers all of the validations to run against that node. You don't actually have to validate anything. You can just run arbitrary code at node enter time with the context of that node. Useful. And then we're going to implement a custom document listener, which implements the after validation lifecycle. So after all of this. Uh, after our validation rule has run against every single node, we're going to trigger a lifecycle hook to do something with all that information that we've gathered from every node. So first step is update our GraphQL user context. It's very similar from before, except now I'm getting a header off the request. And yes, that's it. I'm just getting a header off the request. I'm not getting the context anymore, because or the, the claims principle, because we're not using roles. Um, and then I've also set a hash set to hold on to the product IDs as we parse through this query and we get all of the all of the product IDs out of the arguments for this query. The example I gave was very simple, but imagine it being like five nested and copy pasted three times with different IDs. Could be anything. So here's our 
can roll. So the way this works is can roll just returns a node visitor. And a node visitor is the definition for an event handler for node enter or node leave. This first, uh, this first argument is on node enter, and then there's an optional second argument which you can define an on node leave. We just care about enter. So what this is saying is when we enter a node, if it is an argument type node, it's also interesting that the query itself, everything is described as nodes from the arguments to the values of the arguments to all of the fields and all of the, like, the types of all of the fields. It's very interesting. Uh, so if it's an argument type, then when we enter, we're going to uh, union our request product IDs from our user context with the result of this function, which is kind of long and ugly, so I didn't include it, but basically it just pulls all of the values from that argument if that argument is user product IDs. And then it sets it on that object that we put on our user context, which is going to be passed around for the rest of our, our resolution. And this is the document listener where we're going to define after validation async. So after all of the validations run, including that one, what we get is our user context that now has the full list of all of the product IDs that have been requested for every part of this query. And then we also get a validation result and a cancellation token, because it's an async. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, if we have a user ID, and if there's any requested product IDs, then make this request, which doesn't exist in the sample project, but make the request to the user microservice, say, hey, does this user ID, all of these product IDs, are they valid for this user ID, yes or no? And if it is allowed, then great, return don't do anything. If it's not allowed, then set a validation error. And what this is going to do is the same thing that the original Hello World was doing. It's setting a validation error, which is going to stop resolution of this request. After we get done with the validation phase, which is immediately after this task completes, then we're done, it returns back to the user and says, hey, you don't have access. Also, you have to register your new uh, thing. So you have to register your listener that we just uh, defined. You've got to register your validation role that we just defined. And then in here in validation roles, you have to say, give me all the validation roles that I've registered, add them to all the other validation roles. And one thing about listeners, they actually have a built-in one and they don't want you to override it, so you cannot uh, you cannot set the listener object on this executions options. You can only add to it, so this is a little bit ugly, but it's for every listener that I have defined in my services, add it to the list of listeners in the execution options. And now, when we run this query, so this is my user does have access to credit one. Uh, I don't know if you could read it, but instead of calling an external API in my sample there, I just had it saying, if you've included the loan three product ID, then that's not valid. So this is what it would be if it's valid. It's a list of cash flows for this product. And then if you include one that is not valid, you get an error message. And that's attribute-based uh, validation in GraphQL framework, or GraphQL.net version 2.4. Uh, as far as I can tell, it is fully middleware. So it's, um, there's a couple, there's actually a different library that we're evaluating right now, and it's even more middleware. Like even your um, definitions for how to get your data, you can set up as field middleware that run between your, uh, before the field resolves, and they actually return iQueryables, and then it finally gets to the end, and you can do like two list async. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, it would be. We, um, we do pass around uh, our user IDs as headers, but 
Actually, I'm not sure. Philip, how does that work? Yes. Um, so there's a couple different ways to do that. Some of them are actually pretty ugly, and it's um, it's where you just like set valid queries. So you say we only accept queries that look like this, and then you know, and you've basically turned your GraphQL API into a REST API at that point. Um, but I mean, the most you could do is probably just put a Redis uh, cluster in front of it and just catch similar queries. Because a lot of the queries we're going to be getting, or we are getting, are extremely similar. It's just they want the next page of data. So the only thing that changes is the next page. And if they ask for the same thing, and then the next user comes onto it, and they ask for the same thing, because every time the page loads, it's always page one. So that one would get cached. And so like the first five pages would be cached and load pretty quickly. We have not implemented that yet. We're still in the um, baby steps. but. Yeah, I think the most you could do is just put Redis in front of it. Good question, though. Jonathan? Bonus content. Ha ha. So we don't actually do this here because we don't have a need to. Um, but as soon as it comes across my desk as something that needs to be done, uh, I do have a POC for it. So what he was asking was, in the hello world, it failed your entire request, no matter how much of it was still actually valid. And then my, um, my idea was to resolve what you can. And you can do the same thing with attribute-based uh, you just have to change your request from saying, do all of these IDs match this user, or give me back all of the valid IDs for this user. And then you put those IDs on your user context, and you can pass it down to your resolver, which we didn't really talk about. Um, but then you can resolve your request by passing those IDs into your database and getting the correct things back. One thing that I would not want to do is if you have, like with that cash flows list, if you have a single list, and you've got one ID that's valid and one ID that's not, I wouldn't want to return the list populated with only the things that were valid because your user isn't going to know the difference between what was valid and what is legitimately zero data. But if you've got two sections of data here where this bottom one is invalid because I made this one the arbitrary invalid one and this one is valid, what I would like to see is for this query to get resolved and this query to just be empty. and then you don't have access to loan three. So this is just in the after validation async. Instead of uh, getting a um, just a yes or no from our API, instead we're going to get the list of validated IDs, and we're going to set them on um, that requested product IDs uh, field, or you could have a separate field. doesn't matter. And then that's going to get passed to your resolver that actually hits your database and says, this is the data for this field. Uh, so this is kind of ugly because I did it in like 10 minutes because I thought it would be fun. But basically, we're just saying the difference between the arguments that were passed and the arguments that were validated, uh, if they are different, don't resolve this. That's all this is saying. Which ends up giving you a query where this is invalid, the arguments and the valid IDs are different because the valid and this one is, they're the same, so this one resolves. And so you get a list here and then an empty one, and then it says, hey, you're not valid. <laughs>
just a POC for doing that if we wanted to. Not yet. Um, we have, I mean, as always, you're going to need to have a lot of communication between your back end and your front end. But we have great documentation and we work closely with the front end. So we tell them, like, this is the request. This is what you can expect. If there's a problem, this is the message that you can expect. Um, and then always returning errors with your data. Yeah, I didn't on this one. Um, I can, I mean, I've worked with UIs before where it was like, if the user is logged in, then this widget has some, like a graph or something. And if they're not logged in or if they haven't purchased the product, then it's got like a marketing message there or telling them to log in. And I can see that working well with this sort of flow. But again, they would have to know in advance when they're building it to what to expect. It's not, it's not like with a REST API where it's the same every single time. It is a lot more work on both sides to implement GraphQL. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, if you if yeah. And that's actually the end of the content. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Hopefully uh, we can have more of these because I tried to pick a really small topic and it still ended up being about an hour to talk about it. So if we were talking about something like query batching, we would be here for days. So try to come up with something else. So data loader is pretty cool. Have you ever, so you noticed in the you had, uh, you could ask for multiple products. So let's say you ask for um, an account and, um, and a loan and then the cash flows for both of them. By default, if you don't have data loader, what will happen is it's going to resolve your, um, your account and it's going to go down and it's going to resolve your, um, your, your loan. 
and then it's going to hit the database one time for each of those child cash flows. It's a, the n plus one problem, they call it. So if you don't use something to batch your queries, it's going to kill your database really fast. Uh, also, if you don't have something to catch malicious queries, like deeply nested things or things asking for the max amount of items in every single list, you're also going to knock over your database. So we can talk about query complexity and data loader. Um, but data loader, what it does is instead of um, hitting your database for each node that you're asked for, it'll collect all of the same nodes and then send that, uh, by default, just the IDs of the items that you asked for all at once so that you can get by where in instead of get by uh, ID equals and get it all at once. And then it'll split it back up to put it back on the parent object when it gives it back to the front end. You good. That's uh, that's that's a recommended way for. Yeah. <laughs> Thirty seconds later. Dead. Say again. Yes, but I'm not sure how yet because I just started reading about it. It's called query batching, which is an extremely vague name, but it's query batching on this side. So you would actually set query equals and then query equals, and it would be the equivalent of making two separate GraphQL requests, except the top one will resolve first and then feed into the second one, and the top one comes back to you first, so you can go ahead and start populating your page, and then the second one will come back to you after that. I don't think there's any in C-sharp that have currently implemented that, but I know one of them has it for their next release. Uh, Hot Chocolate, I think, is working on that for their next release. Query batching. Yeah. Oh, there's also a f uh, some support for like conditional statements. So you could say like like include if, and so if if a value comes back and it's something, then you can include it if, or you can not include it, and that's going to something that the client can send to the back end. It's pretty neat. Mm. Well, thanks for coming out. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, again, Cabbage is hiring. I know I say it every time, but definitely check out our website. Um, and if you want to talk to a cabager after this, I'm sure someone can give you more information. Um, yeah, can we get another round of applause for Candace too? Cool. Thanks, guys. Hope to see you at the next one. <laughs>